Humu Talk is a podcast highlighting the lived experiences of Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community health workers and partners, hosted by Naopo and Apcho. Each episode will feature interviews with our community members to destigmatize topics within our Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community, with the goal of providing support and improving our advocacy for our community members. This episode features Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community health workers from Pacific Community of Alaska, Mavis Boone, Kiana Fonua, and Dash Popo Ali'i, who are interviewed by licensed professional counselor and mental health expert Janet Uluki Viola. My name is Janet Uluki Viola. I am a licensed professional counselor here in the state of Alaska. I've been working in mental health for a very long time in psychiatric facilities and group homes and lots of different things, residential. Um, But my level of expertise and my group that I work with typically are adolescents or teenagers and their families and crisis recovery. Um, So I'm looking forward to this, but I'll kind of give you guys the floor to introduce yourselves too. Awesome. Thank you, Janet. Salafalava, falava, everyone. My name is Dash. I use she, her pronouns. I am currently in a lot, living in Alaska, the lands of the Dena'ina Athabascan people. Um, I am a board member of Pacific Community of Alaska, or PCA, and I also wear lots of hats in, in regards to like organ, uh, community organizing and also um, in the homelessness field. So. With that, I'll pass it to Kiana. Thank you so much, Dash Malole. My name is Kiana Fonua. I am a community health worker for the Pacific Community of Alaska. I believe this is my second year. Um, I, outside of community health working, I am still very much in the community, considering that I do work and live in the same community that I like help. Um, I'm an artist and I love, I just love helping. I'm gonna pass it to Mavis. My name is Mavis Boone, and I am the Director of Programs for the Pacific Community of Alaska. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization that works primarily with the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander community residing in Alaska. Uh, I am currently based in Alaska, born and bred on the island, uh, moved to a very icy climate, um, but it's pretty, it, it's a very uh, adverse change, but um I feel like in joining with Pacific Community of Alaska, I've invested my um, compassion into helping the community and helping our people navigate the systems that be. So thank you for this opportunity. And I will revert back to our interviewer. A big part of our talk today is going to be revolving around mental health um, and especially mental health in the community. I mean, we live in Alaska, and despite our state being so big, as far as resources, you know, one thing I think that we are all aware of is that resources are very limited here in Alaska, especially with mental health and behavioral health. And, you know, to the rest of our listeners who may not be local here to Alaska, unfortunately, what that means is that, you know, many people go without services. Um, And so as community health workers and people who just work overall in the community of Anchorage, I mean, what have you guys kind of noticed as far as helping people get access to services or just even speaking about, you know, what's out there? What's that been like? My prior work has been like revolved around homelessness. So I kind of had like a... I guess like a foot in the door and knowing what resources are available and having lived experience of houselessness, there's a lot of different factors that do play a part in that. And just a lot of stigma, a lot of, um, like just a lot of things, a lot of different layers. um, That's part of that. And I think for, for me personally, because there was one, an experience, lived experience in that, in that, um, area. And then two, I was able to work alongside other young people and other organizations that were, that were um, offering the resources that I, I actually knew some of those resources. I was able to share it with um, friends to share it online and just post it on social media. But in, in regards to like, just having it out there to where it's accessible, most definitely, I did not see that or have that, um, like, when I was in high school. So, 
I think it's just like being in the know and like in part of like, you know, participating in organizations and all of this like volunteer opportunities, like that's where I get the information from. But outside of that, it's really nowhere to be found. Like you kind of have to ask around. Thank you, Dash. I think you brought up a couple of good points too that I definitely like to segue into as far as our conversation goes. But before I do, Mavis, did you have anything you wanted to add? I definitely like to mention, like in terms of lived experience, it's very it varies depending on where you're actually based and um, what community you're raised in. So, for example, for me, um, I was more I was raised. Although born in American Samoa, I was raised Western. So I was raised in the independent state of Samoa. And the resources that are available in the United States are very foreign to us. So when I moved up here due to familial reasons, um, I had a really tough time navigating the systems that be. Um, and, and, and I feel like that lived experience is a testimony to the monumental um, barriers that we have for our people that are, you know, not only those that are coming into the United States, but even so those that are still here. Like even coming in with an education, it took me a while to actually get through all the paperwork, all the like the systems. I had to reach out to my siblings to figure out like, what do you need to do? Even with the change in jurisdiction, change in country, there is also like change at the availability of resources that aren't necessarily like glaring at you saying come to me um you actually have to like dig um and find the resources so um i feel that i was in a better place because i came in my my siblings were somewhat established so i had an upper hand i had a leverage in that in in, in that area um, because they were more educated in the American system. So they had access to a lot of resources. They knew where to go. So basically, they just showed me like in the right direction. And I had to find, you know, what resources are there, what I could use. So, I mean, coming up here, I understand the experiences that are going through, uh, like our people's minds when it comes to all the paperwork, all the red tape, um, and the amount of times where they just get a really like, how many times do you say no until you actually break somebody down, right? So, I mean, with all the paperwork, you also got to deal with the refusal and then you got to deal with the paperwork again. And and that's me coming into the system being single, right? No kids. I, Which is why I feel like this is even more so a painful and much more painstaking event for those that do have families that come into to the United States. So that's that's basically my lived experience. Um, and then with joining the health department a few years ago, I I feel like it's, you know, we're, yes, we primarily work with Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, but it's it's a general, it's, it's across the board, right? It's we don't want to play down what the other communities are going through. Uh, but I feel like like in joining with the health department, you you see the variety of issues that a lot of our residents, our community members are going to, you know, going through regardless of whether they're NHPI, like Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander or not. So it's 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 something that that impacts all communities. But I feel with the Pacific community community of Alaska coming into play, we offer that opportunity for our people to actually have some guidance on the resources that be and help them navigate through those resources, especially for families that are trying to make ends meet. And um, so I feel like this podcast gives a bit of edge to what PCA can do for our community. And of course, also come forward and say, you know, we understand what you're going through. Uh, We want to work with you in terms of trying to navigate this uh, in the event that we can't like, we can't find a way, we can always find a way together, um, trying to discuss what they're going through and, and work together to, to find resources for them and their families. I love the fact that you brought into not only just your own personal experience of like trying to figure out how this system works here, you know, but also being somebody who has 
you know, move to the U.S., you're right. There are so many major differences between how so many different communities and especially different countries kind of, um, you know, work to navigate just the overall system, not just to include mental health and behavioral health, you know, but all resources. Um, and, you know, when I kind of reflect and I think about it, I, I think of how we work together um, just as a community, but especially as Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, you know, we are aware that the way that we receive information, and this is, you know, generational stuff and historical stuff is by word of mouth, right? If your aunt or your cousin, your aunt or your uncle, whoever the case is, you know, if they have a piece of information that's shared down, you know, between all of the families, and then that kind of expands to the community. And when I think about how it works in Alaska, it's very similar. It's like, unless you know somebody who has that information and they pass that down to you is when we start to see, okay, now we can start to access this. So really excellent points. Um, both I think Mavis, you and Dash kind of brought up some other things too. And both of them include barriers, um, you know, here within the community, but also stigma. And when I think about the both of those things, I think as far as discussion topic, we're talking about major things that we could be addressing right now. But um, I definitely like to break them down a little bit, to just talking about barriers overall. So we know that one of the barriers definitely is, you know, just kind of accessing resources, because if it's not by word of mouth or people doing a really deep dive on the Internet or actually calling people up you know, physically can be really hard to access them. Um, but just thinking overall, what are some other barriers that you guys have noticed in the community or just by hearing other people talk about them? Other barriers that um, one of the main concerns or one of the main barriers is the, is having access to language or translated material with relation to a lot of the medical issues that are present in the community. Um, although it was prominent at the, you know, right before COVID, um, I think it was even more so during COVID. There was a lot of misinformation. There was a lot of information. Um, and a lot of it was all in English. Like, and, and even with the translations, like to simpler English, a lot of people had to work out, you know, translating English into English. Um, so even for those that could understand English, it would, they had to actually try and understand the English that was used. Um, a lot of it was in scientific language and in language that a lot of, you know, higher ups would understand and medical people would understand, but the lay person wouldn't. So that was, you know, one of the first barriers that arose even for the general community. When it came to NHPI, it was even more so because there was no information available relating the, you know, translated material for COVID. So for a community that's already hesitant when it comes to medical care, um, that didn't help at all. Um, so I feel like that was one of the barriers that existed during COVID, even before COVID, and it still continues after COVID. But at least now with the awareness that is, people are starting to understand that there's need for translation to properly understand what procedures are available to them, what resources are available to them. Because some of them like understand that there are resources, but because of the language access issue, they don't know that's that's what it is, right? Being able to, to, to actually overcome that barrier would be a foot in the door when it comes to health equity. Um, so although we have certain things that have been translated through the state and health department, um, there's still a lot more work to do. And PCA is also um, assisting with some of the, that documentation around state borders, but we feel that there's there's need for a, a bigger push in terms of diversifying the language that a lot of the medical notices and a lot of the, um, a lot of the important material needs to be dealt with that way. I mean, we embrace the diversity of Anchorage but you know, as a people, we also need to understand that diversity that that diversity needs to be um, more action than just spoken, um, and 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 that also starts with the diversity in terms of language. Excellent answers, Mavis. I agree. You know, and I also think about it too because as somebody who has um, been following PCA on social media 
and even is included in like the text chains and all these other things that I've noticed and I really appreciate about PCA especially is the fact that you guys incorporate the graphics into some of these things as well. Um, just so that, you know, as we're talking about, um, you know, one of the barriers being the fact that sometimes this information can't be translated, you know, into the different native languages, the fact that you guys are including pictures in there intentionally. So even if anybody had no idea, you know, what the flyer may have been saying or whatever the case may be, the fact that they could look at that and see, okay, this is what I'm looking for. I think that's great. A community need that I notice now um, and it was still kind of a problem even before like COVID was, I see there's a huge need for transportation in my community. Like, although there are things like, um, like the city bus that is only so dependable because it also relies on the weather. And especially this past winter, it was, I know it was very hard for a lot of our community members who, um, rely on the city bus because even though the buses were still on a schedule going, a lot of the sidewalks were not plowed properly. So a lot of people would either wait at that stop and then get past, or they just could not have, they could not get to it. And it was, it was like very, I'm trying to find the English word for it, but like, you know, in Tongan, it was like really fuck off to like see like go out by like the elderly, like out there having to like wait for a bus that maybe would come to, because I think during the winter too, they even cut some stops and getting access to that sort of information, unless you follow like the the city's uh, bus uh, Anchorage, like Instagram, you would not know that. So definitely social media is a big tool too with helping our community because um, we disperse information given, that, given by the city that maybe our community doesn't know about. So yeah. Um, but I think to backtrack to your first question about like lived experiences with uh, finding resources, especially here in our community in Anchorage, um, my lived experience, was, it really had to do with uh, like finding a mental health provider that I could trust. That was hard in itself because coming to terms with, oh, do I want to see someone and talk about these things? It was, it was good, but it was also kind of scary because not a lot of people in our community or like let alone our culture like really even want to talk about it so finding a provider was like an interesting experience because it was like who would I want to trust like how does this look like and I knew for sure it had to be a woman so that was for sure and then I knew that I wanted either a I was shooting for the stars but I wanted a native Hawaiian Pacific Islander therapist but I knew that it was very limited here in Anchorage. Now, I didn't have to check resources. Like I know what the health providers look like here from the point of view as a um, community member, because this was before I was a CHW for PCA. This was like during the pandemic, I think 2021 or 2022. My memory is kind of muddy because 2020 to 2023 is just one really long year in like my brain, but. Yeah, definitely navigating to find a um, a therapist that was a woman and probably black or brown that was based in Alaska. It was pretty hard. I ended up using a website that listed like all the therapists within Anchorage. Um, they all had like a profile, like their photos were there, what uh, like what clinics they worked at. It was honestly it was kind of a godsend to find that website because having to find providers outside of like private clinics that were only listed on their website, it was kind of hard. And most of them, they did not match what I would need, what I knew would make me comfortable with a provider, but I ended up finding one. She was really cool. I think about her a lot and it's really awesome to see her in the community now because I see that she, she kind of like grew more from like um, the last time we spoke. Like I see her do community stuff and then how I work as a CHW. So it's kind of like, it's almost full circle in this, in a sense, but yeah. I think another barrier um, to add that I'm thinking of is really like the dynamic of a lot of like families in, in Alaska, like for folks that, for some, for some families, like we live in multi-generational homes, right? And when it comes down to setting appointments, like getting people to th their appointments and things like that, like there's a lot that happens internally within families to figure out 
who, for one, who has the availability to be able to take so and so to who has transportation to be able to do that. Like we're all kind of like living in this paycheck to paycheck world and it doesn't happen. like it doesn't help that we're inflation is real right now and has always been, but even more so now. Um, and there's like a lot of folks that you work to work and get, you know, do what like, you know, to get all the the necessities and all the, the the needs that not even wants, just the needs that you need to get for like the week or or the month or so. But on top of that, we have like um our elderly, like you know, our elderly folks, we have babies, we have we have all the, you know, all the children of the corn, like everyone is at home or when school's out or when the, the young people and the students don't have school, they, they're stuck at home. And now somebody has to be home to be able to watch all of the all of the kids. Right? So there's so many things that um, that's that could happen. And like the dynamic of like every family is different, but it's like for Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders, it's very common that there's always someone to like, you know, that's that's watching someone. There's like everybody has their own routine and their own schedule. So when it comes to like trying to find resources like or take care of yourself specifically when it comes to like your health, your mental health, it's really non-existent if you don't put it within your routine or within your schedule if that makes sense like I think that's what that's something that I've I've seen um and being that I I live by myself I I, I like visit my 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 mom and like my the rest of the family so um every time I'm there I can see that visibly and I'm like oh my gosh everybody is like on the go, everybody has something to do, like to do. Everybody is on a schedule, and nobody really takes time to kind of like just pause and like really, you know, um, reflect on themselves. Like they don't even get time to do any kind of self care. Like the self care is together, family care is what it is. So I think that's another. I mean, it could be a, a blessing and a barrier at the same time, depending on you know how how folks feel um, because. I, you know, like for other folks, like family is where we get our strength and our 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 um our peace from, but it could also be the opposite too. So really thinking of all of those different um you know, different situations. But yeah, that to add that. You guys are bringing up some really excellent points. Uh Mavis, did you have anything that you wanted to add to that too? Yeah. Um. So basically, Dash and Kiana have already already like touched on them. Uh, Kiana, in terms of not being able to find a therapist, um, that's also a barrier for us that are actually living in Alaska. Um, a lot of our people don't know, but we don't have any PI and HPI providers, doctors. Um, like with you now, we have like, you know, mental health providers. And I know that, you know, there are a few more. But in terms of like general family practice, medical providers, we don't have any up here. And that was very, um, that was one of the barriers that we went through as a board, uh, trying to find somebody that looks like us, knows what, you know, knows our lived experience. Um, knows our lived experience and what we you know how we're raised our state of mind our state of understanding when it comes to family and family care um that was something that that was a barrier that the board of pca um had to try and overcome during covid because we had to find somebody that could in uh, you know stabilize the situation and provide that trust within the community especially as as a, as a medical provider so we ended up um bringing in Dr. Malik Fumono uh, from Seattle, um, from Washington to actually as, as a, as like a zoom call or a podcast um, actually it was a podcast um, to, to help explain the situation, explain the medical information um, to try and help our people understand the situation, you know, in our own language from somebody that looks like us. So um 
that was ba yeah so so we had to do it that way even though we had to like bring him on like virtually that was the only thing we could do um at the time so we're thankful to him too um coming through for us in terms of trying to help us get to our people um alleviate a lot of the confusion that was going on during that time um with reference i do appreciate um the story that dash has told in terms of like there's no self-care there's only family care because that's the way we've always um come together as a people we're very family oriented especially those that are actually uh brought up in the islands and in the way of the island so um and i feel like a lot of that it yes it is it sometimes is a good thing sometimes it's not such a good thing um but in terms of support, it is a good thing um, when it comes to uh, family orientation and trying to stabilize yourself in a community where you just moved to. Having that support is gold um, for me coming up alone. Maybe, I, you know, I didn't go through it, so um, I can't speak to it. But coming up alone and being able to be supported by my, my siblings was a plus. I, I even though they're also like trying to build their own families, having their support during that time of transition was was gold for me. So when it comes to when it comes to self care, I, I think in the early stages of trying to find yourself and establish yourself in the community, our way of support is is monumental when it comes to that establishment and trying to either building a fresh start or coming from another state or coming from the islands. I feel like that communal support, it, you, when you come into a family that's always had that communal support, it it, help, it helps you establish further compared to coming to, to a place where you need to find yourself and then find a job and find everything. Um, it does take away from all of that overwhelming, um, you know, trying to configure yourself into where you're going. So, so yeah. Um, although, but in terms of, I know that as Pacific Islanders, we're also kind of, we kind of move towards supporting our families. Now, the value and, you know, the, the amount that goes into contributions is, is always, you know, a give and take in terms of whether you can afford it and things like that. So that it's, it's, it's a give and take and you, you just have to establish, um, something that's good for you and your family, not overdo it. Um, where we tend to, uh, when it comes to our falavelaves, where it comes to our contributions to our families, our time. Um, now I, I, I moved away from like the family scheme. I'm more kind of like moving towards myself in, in, in a lot of ways, but I still have my nieces over and I still have my nephews over. Um, so I still break the bank when it comes to them and they come over. So, you know, whether it's I feel like self-care for me is like investing in them um, and and help ensuring that they're also happy. So, you know, I don't know. It's self-care for me because it kind of builds me up as a, as, as being a very good aunt. Um, but at the same time, I feel like it's it's good for them too to still keep that connection with family um, to ensure them that they're, they're not in it alone excellent points especially with bringing up the family dynamic too especially because you know especially within the nhpi community you know we've recognized that we are definitely a collectivist culture you know we function more together as a group and in our numbers than we do as one and individuals um but one thing i definitely want to bring up too and ask a little bit about is what has that been like you know kind of growing up in this larger family dynamic you know, Dash and Mavis, you guys definitely brought up some of these topics in your discussions, but kind of branching off from the overall family and trying to navigate this as an individual, you know, I know that has also caused stress, I'm sure, because I'm doing the same myself. Just something interesting that has gone on overall, the family dynamic of like, you're going to be on your own, you're not this and you're not that. And, you know, we all function together as a group without all causing stress. Um, you know, what have your experiences kind of been like with that? Thank you for that question. That's a good question, Janet. I think that it definitely is an interesting experience being an adult, especially as a 
Christopher Callender, but uh, a Tongan adult living out on her own as is my experience, especially because within Tongan culture, you don't move out unless you're married. So the fact that I moved out and I'm not married and I'm doing me, it's very like interesting to my family, but I feel that it's also like it builds character, me living outside of the home, even though moving as a unit, as a family is the way. I like that my experience still influences my family, even though I don't live in the home with them. They see that I've grown and I've, changed in better ways since the pandemic and especially since seeing a mental health provider I still try to talk to them about um, therapy and kind of just destigmatizing it within my own family because I know it's a problem for their community but my community community is my family so I have conversations with them especially with um, my younger siblings because I am the second oldest of technically nine but five um, I have bonus siblings, but I think that um, I, I especially speak about my experience with them because um, I feel that they are the ones that I need to know that like, I do share the same parents as you, but I understand we all experience them differently. So we're both gonna have like different views about our childhood and whatnot. And I talk to them about therapy all the time. They get kind of weirded out because they're like, why are you talking to people about our problems? I'm like, dude, you're 13. You need to talk to somebody about your problems. Because <laughs> I tell them all the time, like, I may be 23 right now, but there are still things that bothered me from then. And so, like, it's kind of, like, not fixing it. It's like a soft intro into see a provider when you feel like it and know that it's okay if you don't want to. Also know that it's okay to, like, speak to other people outside of our family that are certified. So trying to work with that. Um yeah those character influences the family still I guess my experience in um like living on my own it's been I mean not all families are great right not every every family has a story <clears throat> excuse me every family has a story some you know some what, what do they call it is skulls in a bag or whatever something like that right all families have that uh, I think for my situation uh specifically um there was a time where I I wasn't, I basically couldn't be myself. I couldn't be my full authentic self as part of the LGBTQIA 2S plus community. And it was to a point where it was toxic. It was, um, I wouldn't say violent, but it was definitely abuse in, in the home, like to, to an extent. And from that situation, like I've had to, to really, you know, get myself outside of that. And I didn't realize that I could at that time because it was so family oriented. Like I love my family. I was born and raised in a family, like family home, like family, like what we're talking about, like very family oriented. But I think I'm saying this out loud to really say that it's okay to step away when there are things that just does not, it's not right, like does not make sense. It's not right to you, like to yourself. And just if, if it's physically, mentally, emotionally, like it's just not right to where a lot of, um, like I said earlier about like all these different layers and factors, like to where there's a possibility of like suicidal thoughts. There's possibilities of like other routes that we really don't want to think about. Some communities are very religious, religious is not always the answer for unfortunately like for like from my own experience like you can pray all you want or you can you know you can be as religious as you want but there are other things that folks are going to use against the situation and like utilize like religion as you know like the, that christianity mentality as part of it or like the reasoning but it's not a real reason but um all of that to say that it's okay to step away when situations are toxic and it's not safe for yourself or for your family. So I'm the youngest. I'm like the baby of five siblings and the most rebellious, one, obviously. And um, yeah, and it's it's okay to step away if it's not, if it doesn't feel right and it doesn't feel good. It, it does not mean that that's, 
the end all be all, but there's gonna there's gonna be like for any situation, there should be time and there has to be conversations. There has to be things that happen in between to figure out where the compromise is or what that looks like. And really still, because regardless, I need my family and I, I, I love them regardless of all the craziness that happened. Like I still love and need my family. So, you know, it's okay to step away, not really do you, but like step away and be, be real realistic with your situation and your family situation before anything else. But yeah, I did, I did want to bring that up and, or at least like share a little bit about that. Yeah. Thank you, Dash. You bring up something huge and it's kind of a foreign concept in our culture, which is boundaries and even recognizing sometimes that when things are not good for us um, and, and are unhealthy, especially that we have to try and once again, navigate what that's like is how do I even set a boundary in our, my family? You know, when I'm so used to just things being or even from our elders, like just being told straight away, like you have to do this. There's no questions asked, right? There's no, nope, I'm sorry, I can't, I don't have time for that. It's like, okay, I'm going to get it done now, right? So a very foreign concept. But I also want to validate you too, Dash, with your experience. Um, and I hear that. And it's something that I hear pretty frequently in our community sometimes. And we do have to take a step back. Um you know, from our dynamics to really work on ourselves and get ourselves healthy and making sure that we're good. So I hear you. Thank you for sharing that. My field that I work in primarily are with youth and their families. And Dash and Kiana, I'm aware that you guys have also worked with adolescents, um, you know, in the field and just kind of getting a gauge and an understanding of what that has been like, since I know there was a big project that happened um, in a video that I got to watch last year um, that you guys did with our youth. So just talking a little bit about mental health, youth in our community and what you guys had seen during that time. For sure. Yeah. BTG, Bridging the Gaps. That was the project that um, Janet's referencing in that. I miss in love. It was an awesome learning experience and it was a good way for me to really feel connected to the youth that I was not familiar with. Um, the documentary was like three parts. And so it was awesome speaking to them and asking them like questions where it was like, I want you to tell me what you're thinking, like exactly what you're thinking. I want to, I want to know your experience about being a Pacific Islander youth, especially in Alaska during this time, because even though I have that experience here, I was before the pandemic, you know, I graduated in 2018. So it was awesome hearing how they felt about like class and their culture and especially their community, um, especially after the pandemic too, because a lot of things changed. Um, Anchorage, it's its own place and its own time, but like even then, like everything has changed since then. It was nice to hear their perspective on things. And it was really interesting to see like uh, their connection to culture and like how they saw certain things in our culture that you kind of just was like, you peeped it when you were younger and then you just left it alone. Cause like, if I say something, I'm probably gonna get popped in the mouth. So I'm just not gonna do it. But them, I love them because they'll say it anyways. And that's why I respect them. <laughs> So it was awesome giving them that platform and that space to be like, just sound off. But yeah, it was awesome. And I still text them here and there. The project finished back in June. That's when um, we did the premiere. But like, I still text them here and there, seeing how they are. And it was nice building that relationship with them because I know like this project was memorable and they're always going to have like some sort of connection, not only to me, but also to PCA and meeting other youth that they might have never talked to. Yeah, I think that was the beauty of the the BTG uh, project or the Bridging the Gaps project was really that um, network piece. Like there are folks that went to the same school, but never really got to to actually be in community with each other. So they built those like new friendships, new relationships outside of school. And most of them were, it was either they're graduating their year, like th they were graduating that year or they have like one more year. So that that um, relationship that they built has also kind of like brought them out of their comfort zone that there are other organizations, there are like specific events and specific projects like catered to Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander young people that 
they can, you know, they can join, they can be a part of. And if they have any thoughts or ideas or, or other like project ideas that they might have, like they, they're more than welcome to like send us a message, like to, to text us and we can see if it's even possible or even like there's a lot of funding out there. So we can always look to see if there are funding available to make that work and to make it happen. Cause these are, you know, these are events and these are things that our young people are asking for. And it's okay to, to really kind of like, you know, get out of like that comfort zone of like your own just church folks, like just school folks or just family. Like it's okay to to meet others and um and really be outside and and share not only your experiences, like your perspective and your ideas that somebody else might have been thinking of and be like, oh yeah, we could definitely do something about it or you know, a project, which ironically is how um Nisian Lounge, which happened, it's it's kind of like a virtual group conversation that we started, um, when I say we, uh, myself, William and Vanessa, who um, were like the OG board members of um, PCA. So it was during COVID and there was a lot of young people on Instagram, like there was just like sharing, like that was, TikTok was the outlet, right? TikTok was the outlet of like sharing how I feel so isolated. I feel so lonely and all of these things. And there's nobody to really talk to other than on a virtual, like in a virtual sense, right? So we created this group that happened like once a month um, to just be able to to really let go and vent and whatever is like, you know, heavy on their on their shoulders. Or it was kind of like a low-key therapy session for all of us because we went from talking about COVID to school to work to like family um like to family, to makeup, like there were fun times, but they're also like real serious times too. And the conversation really uh, just went from, like, I mean, the conversation went from just having a conversation to really building community within that space. So to this day, like it hasn't happened like on a consistent basis due to capacity and, and other priorities, but we all, like we still have connections to these folks. Like it started off with just, Alaska, but we ended up getting folks that were living in like Florida, like somebody was in Germany. Like I don't know how they found us, but I think it was on Instagram, like social media at its best. So it was very, it was very cool to see that. And even even though we're all like miles and miles across the across the world, like we all bonded through um through conversation and really this um just being part of the a Native Hawaiian Pacific community. So yeah, a lot of great things, and hopefully we have a lot more um, coming up, and maybe we'll find more funding to to make things happen. So, yeah. Um. So I thought I'd also um kind of add in as like an observer, um, uh, because then, like even from a cultural standpoint, um, there are like invisible lines when it comes to like how our how were we live in our culture um so being the eldest of five um there's a lot of responsibility that comes with it eldest of five and then the eldest grandchild like you have to set the bar high for the rest of them so there's a lot and it's not like they'll come to you and say you have to do this because you're the you're you're the eldest child you're the eldest you kind of just feel like it's just loaded onto you invisibly um and I feel like that's a lot with our community when it comes to responsibility. Um, and it's hard to create boundaries when it comes to those because of the way we've always been raised and the expectations of our families, of our people. Um, so when it comes to a lot of that, a lot of the way that we were brought up and all these in, you know, individual and of course communal expectations, we tend to carry those through and invest them on our children. Right. And then. And that's always the way it's been. And that's always the way we tend to react to a lot of situations. So having nieces and nephews that come to you with their feelings is somewhat of a challenge for their aunt because I wasn't brought up in a touchy, feely, share your feelings kind of, you know, environment. And 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 I feel for them, you know, um, because they come up to me and they share their story and their aunt is just totally um you know, oblivious to how you can help them. 
because I just feel like although my, you know, although my parents or my grandparents didn't say, you know, you just have to roll with the punches or, you know, or, you know, butter, you know, just toughen up buttercup. It's it's kind of like a innate kind of DNA thing that you just take charge of the situation and work through it, right? So when my niece and my nephew and my niece come over to me and say, Auntie, I got I got a problem and they gotta share. So in the beginning, when, when you know, when I didn't really um go with, you know, with what they were saying, I'm like talking to myself, feeling like, how am I gonna help these kids? Um so normally you'd be like, be on the islands and be like, okay, go do something else. Like, don't, don't, don't bother me with your feelings, right? Um, but then I come and then I have like going through the work that we do with PCA and how invested we are in our community and the youth. It changes a lot. It changes a lot of perspective, having access to like people such as Dash, having access to Taffy. Um, and, you know, just continuing that kind of discussion that, you know, brings about more understanding of the issues. Then you take notice of things that you know are there, but you tend to kind of like disregard on a whim, um, such as the environment that they're brought into, the friends that they have in school, their school life, their online gaming, like a lot of things that they're exposed to, we're, we weren't exposed to when we were little. So it's it's somewhat a new idea for us to venture into that. And I know that a lot of parents actually go through that same thing, but instead of trying to help the child through navigating their feelings, we tend to brush them off. And that's always been the case, you know, but at least when, you know, when our parents brushed us off, it was just for us being naughty because we had, you know, we could go outside, we could, we weren't into a lot of all these, you know, things. But then moving to the United States and understanding things that children are exposed to, the curriculum, what's taught in school, uh, the news, a lot of media, you 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 then try you then tend to understand how much they're going through, having access to a lot of information that's taboo to us on island. Like we don't have sex education in school, you know, unless you're doing biology then you kind of go into that that field but we don't do those in like high school we don't learn those in high school we don't learn those in, in middle school it's not part of the curriculum right so you know in them understanding those and then access to technology phones information is just coming in you know whether you want it or not it's going to come your way so you know and, and and being on the islands a lot of that is restricted right so if you have a phone you get access but if you have access it's only for calling it's not to do all these searching and googling and right so you, in understanding a lot of that you tend to have to change your approach in a lot of things and then try to understand where the kid is coming from right because you know it, it's not it's not it is a fact that we know very much how what our forms of discipline are when it comes to those that come from the island, right? And and the understanding that is like <laughs> sometimes our discipline really does go overboard. Um, and then in not understanding your child, the frustration that comes out of not understanding or not willing to understand where your child is coming from pushes a parent to that sort of, you know, into that sort of corner. And then with their lack of understanding or, you know, ignorance to wanting to understand, they then put themselves in a predicament of abuse, you know, towards the child of not willing to understand. So that's also part of why we work with the bridging the gaps, right? In Nisian, these kind of programs are um, aimed towards the youth so that they could share their frustrations when it comes to tough love, share their frustrations in terms of not understanding like this generational gap, how we're brought up and not understanding all of that. Um, that's that's the basis of a lot of our programs when it comes to youth is trying to understand where their parents are coming from and why they don't understand what they're going through, you know, and, and trying to find a middle ground where you can create a more healthy environment where our people are more open to understanding. And of course, our children are more open to sharing what they're going through rather than keeping it bottled up. Right. Um, and a lot of times we we tend to you know, a lot of a lot of times we tend to want them to bottle them up, you know, just just, you know, just suck it up. And then if you'll figure it out. 
right? Or find something for them to vent, but it's not helpful in the long run as your children develop. Like it, it's not a point of me trying to address parenting um, because, of, you know, Lord knows we, we, we have a lot of parents that still need adulting. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's, it's just a concept of being somebody that's on the outside looking in um, trying to navigate as well, uh, you know, mental health and the mental issues that a lot of our community go through. And because of the lack of awareness and the lack of understanding in terms of how to navigate these changes, we're put in a position where we're volatile, right? Volatile to all the other aspects that come through, uh, whether it be discipline, domestic violence, or just neglecting your child because you don't know what to do. Um, and we feel like this is a position that PCA would like to take a stand on in terms of trying to help our people um, understand the difference of exposure, the difference of understanding, and then help them as well build that healthy environment for you know not only their children, but it helps with the greater good in terms of their families as well. Thank you, Mavis, and I'm glad that you brought up, too, some of the family programs and the support that will be happening through um, PCA as well, um, and some other events that will be coming up, but I'll save a little bit of time at the end for you to talk about that, too. I know there's an event that's coming up here within the next couple of days um, that maybe we can kind of address and share with the community, too. Um, but once again, just kind of being mindful of our time, you know, I will be honest, I have like a series of questions pretty much that I want to be able to spend some time here asking you guys, but um, we'll start to kind of wrap it up a little bit. But I guess maybe one of the last things that I'd like to kind of end our discussion off is um, one thing that maybe has helped you kind of bring up mental health, you know, to your loved ones um, and just kind of sharing that with our listeners and our viewers today before we kind of end our discussion. I think the one thing for uh, for me personally was really like unlearning a lot of things, and in that kind of like in that situation or in that within that unlearning of things that just did not feel right, did not look right for me, was really also having that open like open ended conversation with my with my family, right? So, um, like for an example that I'll share as like. We always go back to like I always hear this this phrase. That's how we were brought up. This is how we were brought up. Like that was then. This is now, right? Like so. I think always like for me, it was always re reminding like my my sister, like reminding like reminding my my siblings, reminding my mom, like like okay, that was then. Like that was that time. Like this is a a whole new you know, whole new society, whole new things that they're exposed to, like to Mavis's point. Uh, so how are we going to, you know, how gonna, are we going to work through that? Um, when it comes to talking about like mental health, it really wasn't like, it, it's non-existent. Like really, it's really not even, it's not even, not even in a lot of folks like, m like minds or anything like that. Like it's not even part of their routine. It's not part of um, like, you know, their care and things like that. But I think like, the conversation really goes back to like the different, like uh, all these different things that we were told that we should believe in, or like it's the right way is to really sit through the conversation with like, you know, with my, my mom, my, my siblings, like for an example, I shared that. Why is it like for, I've always heard this when I was young, like I always heard, yeah, marry a, a, a white guy. Like that was always a thing that was said, right? Marry a white guy. And then now that I'm like sitting there and thinking, I'm like, why is it always marry a white guy? Why can't it just be marry a good person or marry a good partner or like find a good partner that will love you regardless? Like, why does it have to be specifically a white guy? But then, you know, breaking down all of those like, like historical context in itself, it's like there's so much anti-blackness and anti like you know like like there's so much racism racism in our culture and like in our in our different like cultures and different beliefs that was instilled within us that kind of just became the norm so like really I think for me it was really like okay let's break these things down because it's not making any sense and when when you when you 
have that conversation in that way of like really kind of like digesting the information and like kind of like you know this is this point this is blah 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 like your family tends to, to really sit there and think like oh you're right nobody said like you would never hear like for my family like you would never hear anybody say marry a, a black person marry a hi hispanic person it was always marry a balangi guy or the white guy it's like why because they have money they're you know all of these things it's like superior all of those other things but yeah i think that's one thing i would say that's kind of like just unlearning a lot of things <laughs> and really uh, being comfortable and sitting in that um like you know in the know and that uncomfortable conversation and just kind of talk through it instead of just brushing it off so yeah I think for me, um, in terms of that question is what I've always like understood is children are seen, but not heard. Um, that's always been the understanding in a lot of circles when you're on the island and it tends to migrate with you as you come through. Um, and I feel like that is an aspect that I try to unlearn, that I've tried to unlearn when it comes to uh, building bridges with community, building bridges with families, especially within my own, uh, because we always expect that. Um, that is the expectation that children are seen but not heard. Um, but in moving to the States, understanding the situation, you tend to reestablish, you know, try and reconfigure all of it. So... Um, that is an aspect that a lot of our families still practice. And, you know, although you don't want to kind of tackle that understanding because it, it vests in both culture and religion, which are the pillars of our community, you know, on island and off island, um, it is something that needs to be better discussed within the community. Um, to be better addressed within the community because we know that a lot of us migrate here and then start building families. So our children are those that are actually being exposed to the various, you know, elements um, within the United States. So they have, you know, much more, more awareness of what they're going against and what they're exposed to. So, Yes, it may be the, the situation on island, but coming to the States and being exposed to a lot, you know, a wider variety of things, it's it's time to give our children a seat at the table um, where they can express, you know, what they're going through within the school, what they're going through within their families. Um, it's, it's time to also give them a seat at the table to share their story and build a better bridge between them and, and their families within their families to give them that opportunity to, sh to share. I would say just to be the influence. I recognize that I needed a mental health provider uh, and I just did, I did just that. And by doing that and taking the initiative of researching for someone to talk to like that, I was able to learn like better speaking habits not only to myself but also to my family you know expressing like personal boundaries and being honest about things because I feel like when you live with your family for your whole life you're just supposed to act a certain way with them and then as you become an adult you realize I kind of don't want to do that or I don't think that and so to recognize that and be able to still express that to my family and still have a really good relationship with them it was a big bonus that I see from um, reaching out and finding a mental health provider because by learning those new habits, I'm able to live more in my truth and my family, they see that and they see the growth and like the glow from bettering yourself. And it kind of helps at the same time too with destigmatizing, um, like speaking to a mental health provider within my family. Everybody beyond my grandma and her sisters, I don't know, but my grandma, my siblings were cool and that's really all that matters to me, but yeah. Perfect. Thank you guys so much for answering all the questions today. And then also just answering so honestly, too. I know it can be kind of hard talking about mental health stigma and all the things that are kind of attached to this subject, you know, within the NHPI community, but I really appreciate it. 
Um, and then just to officially end us off, Mavis, I know that um, there was some discussion too about the family support program. So if we can use that to kind of end us off today um, and just talking a little bit about, you know, what resources there are as far as um, what's available through PCA. So our listeners and our viewers understand, you know, this is where you guys can go to if you have any questions, or these are some places you can go to for resources, anything like that, that you might be able to provide us. PCA has recently expanded into domestic violence and sexual assaults. Uh, so at the moment, our soft launch for our uh, DVSA or domestic violence and sexual assault program, addressing domestic violence, sexual assault, suicidal ideation in our community and a lot of um, things that happen within our families that we don't, that we've tended to regard as the norm, um, but being objective about it, um, looking from the outside in and understanding what falls within domestic violence um, and giving that tool to our community to understand what it's all about. Um, in terms of resources, uh, PCA, uh, in turn, um, for taking on the DVSA program, we have uh, we understand the fact that a lot of our families reside in multi generational homes. A lot of the mainstream programs provide for assistance to mostly nuclear families. Um, so the program has provided PCA with an avenue to assist for those that uh, are in excess of five family members. PCA understands the fact that our, our families are also our support system, and we want to ensure that the family is not fragmented when it comes to DVSA situations within the home. We want to ensure that we are able to provide for those that live in multi-generational homes that are actually experiencing on a general level domestic violence and sexual assault. So we also, we provide emergency placement in hotels for such situations. Uh, we also provide uh, first month's rent and security deposit. Uh, we also provide a lot of interventions um, in terms of food assistance, uh, transports, relocation, if it be the case that it's from outside of Anchorage. Um, uh, we are working with Anchorage, Matsu, Fairbanks, Juno, and Barrow um, for this program. Um, and we'd also be providing a lot of assistance in terms of educating our mainstream providers, not on DVSA, but on our culture so that they understand the lived experience of our people, the cultures of our people, so that they can better uh, relate to the services that we need. And of course, relay the information in a more culturally relevant view or culturally relevant lens so that our people are better served um, in the communities that they reside. And in, in terms of those, we also uh, take on case management from some of our mainstream providers that refer cases over that are for families that exceed the five, ben five, you know, five member benchmark. Um, for our community health work, which is uh, when it comes to our domestic violence sexual assault program. We also have our health and wellness program under which our community health workers are assigned in terms of case management, uh, resource navigation, translation, um, as well as medical provider connection. So we are also able to help even after the incident. Um, we can always refer it over to our CHW workers that are assigned for that particular service. Um, in the event that it's only you only need assistance with navigation, we can always consider it as a K uh, CHW case. So feel free to contact us if you need assistance in anything. Uh, we have case workers that speak fluent Samoan. We also have those that speak Tongan. We have translations in both Tongan and Samoan in the meantime. Uh, we can always reach out to our partners in other states with assistance with our Micronesian community as well as our Melanesian community. So feel free to reach out. We are, PCA is a member of NAOPO or the National Association of Pacific Organizations. 
And we have their assistance in a lot of the programs that we provide. And we can always reach out to our partners within those circles to help with our other communities. So please feel free to reach out and we'll see what we can do to help you. Thank you. This episode was brought to you by Naopo and Aptro with funding from the Health Resource and Services Administration. To learn more about Pacific Community of Alaska, visit their website at pcalaska.org.